management of snoring and obstructive sleep apnea. Non-surgically, avoid the risk factors, weight, sleeping position, pharmacological agents to dry up the airway, otherwise just to deepen the sleep cycle, not effective and actually damaging. Positive airway pressure in many forms, we'll review that, and oral appliance therapy to move the tongue forward, place tension on the lateral walls of the oropharynx, and uh, increase the airway. Surgically, tracheostomy was the historical way of opening up someone's airway, not something most people like to do. Laser-assisted UPPP, not effective. We'll go over why later. A lot of money is made by the ENTs because 10 years ago, for 20 minutes in the OR, they could make $3,600. So UPPPs were being done all over the place. And they actually damaged the ability to breathe a year later. Um, maxillary and mandibular advancement, effective when other things and when other treatments have failed. I'm, I'd like to complete the area on CPAP, take a couple of minutes, and uh, then take, take our break. CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure. You have what's called BiPAP, in which the machine has a separate inspiratory pressure and separate expiratory <clears throat> pressure, and then APAP, autopap, in which the uh, air pressure is uh, adjusted, computerized, so the airway stays open. The, people think CPAP is blowing air into the lungs. It is not. The purpose of CPAP is some gentle pressure to keep the airway ballooned out. It's not high enough to force airway into the lungs or to keep someone breathing out. All it is is enough pressure to gently balloon the airway so it doesn't collapse. Usually, 8 to 15 centimeters of water pressure. If someone says they're at 30 centimeters, to breathe, you're not going to help them with the sleep appliance. If they say I'm 8, 9, 10 centimeters, that's my setting, you're likely to help them. This is the gold standard for treatment of obstructive sleep apnea. Several different types. CPAP, the pressure stays constant to balloon out the airway. BiPAP, the pressure drops during expiration. And AutoPAP, the pressure is constant during inspiration and expiration, but the pressure can vary up and down as the machine determines that you need that. Know that in <clears throat> for a study to be done, you need to tell your patients. They need to tell the physician there is snoring, witnessed apneas, arousals from sleep, tiredness. The Epworth sleepiness scale, which I'll show you and you should have seen along the way, is also in the handouts, is greater than 10. There are medical comorbid comorbidities, um, high blood pressure, cardiovascular accidents, heart attacks, stroke, and for an in-lab sleep studies, as of a few months ago, they are requiring a failed home sleep study test. The CPAP requires for coverage, for them to be covered after their sleep study. An AHI greater than five, or it may be eight or nine or 10, depending on their policy. Um, oxygen desaturations, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine said a desaturation of 3% is high enough to qualify for an, uh, an apnea. The feds want 4%, so not as many people qualify. They need to keep using the CPAP 70% of nights, four hours um, per night, or the cost of their keeping their CPAP will not be covered. Compliance on your CPAP patients is determined the first week. So if you can convince your patient that's a CPAP patient, give it your all for a week. You're helping them out. And understand that there are hundreds of masks, hundreds of different options for interfacing with that CPAP. And the more you can get your patients to use the CPAP, the better it is for them. And we're here to serve our patients. Only when they failed CPAP, can't wear it, won't wear it, do we step in and say, let's do a sleep appliance? Um, CPAP tolerance, adherence, effectiveness. Increase with improved nasal airflow. You may be the person that says um, you need to be on a nasal decongestant three nights, see if it works, and um, some other things we can do to help you with your CPAP. Question? Yeah, where does the Fed get their 4% level? How do they justify that when the American Academy of Sleep Medicine says 3%? There's, there's some Does not have to justify the same way. The same way Fed decided the only 
appliances we're going to use that we will accept and pay for are Herbst design appliances. There's no logic to it. Okay. Someone in the Fed decided it and we don't have a choice. Treatment of nasal resistance. Be willing to use nasal strips. I'll go over which ones I think are the best. The nasal steroids, Flonase, Nasacort, now available over the counter, should be used every night for someone that has um, nasal resistance. Surgery of many types, turbinates, deviated septum to let people breathe through the nose will increase, this will increase acceptance of CPAP and of your oral appliance. And right now, you're going to find that the APAP is going to take a greater usage in sleep medicine because they're not going to, they're going to start not following up with sleep studies. They're going to put someone on APAP, they're going to take the computerized readings as how that's been working, and that's going to end up being the follow-up sleep study. So be aware of that. We make our living doing oral appliances. But our goal should be to best serve our patients and our allegiance should be to the welfare of our patients, not our profit. When we're discussing CPAP versus oral appliance, a CPAP machine in one of the three forms, CPAP, BiPAP, APAP, is known for much greater effectiveness at treating sleep apnea. CPAP is the gold standard of sleep apnea treatment. But there's a lower compliance to its use because people don't like being tethered. Oral appliances are usable for the mild to moderate sleep apnea. They are less effective than CPAP. And we do have greater compliance with the appliances. So CPAP, gold standard, most effective, less compliance oral appliances, not as effective, is effective for a lower range of sleep apnea, but much greater compliance. People can travel with sleep appliances, easier to use. And we do have situations where it takes a combination of CPAP and an oral appliance to be effective. I mentioned, and this is from Dr. Friedman, that what's going to happen these days, and you need to be aware of it because you'll be affected by it, is that the patient will have some sort of sleep study. They'll be given the options for um, weight loss, some sort of CPAP, oral appliance, surgery. We'll often go into an APAP usage. The APAP machine will record how they're breathing and then they'll be reevaluated. So you won't see separate sleep studies. That will happen in the next few years. Just be aware and roll with it so you can tell your physicians, yeah knew that was happening. Th some interesting treatments. This WINX uh, is a small suction device and you're going to ask how does a suction device work to help apnea. Goes in the mouth, gentle suction pulls the tongue forward. This little piece of the appliance reflexively moves the tongue forward and opens up the airway. About 40% of patients will get some benefit from this. Whether you view it as one of your competitors or an adjunct treatment, adjunctive treatment, I'm not yet sure. I don't have one to play with, but I think that has potential. Surgery for obstructive sleep apnea. The UPPP shows an initial improvement of only 30% of the patients benefiting. Then, not only do the patients revert after UPPP to the baseline or worse, this UPPP decreases the rigidity of the airway and you actually then, after a year, get greater airway collapse. So UPPPs are not effective in any way long-term for sleep apnea. Other surgeries, maxillary mandibular advancement, in some cases it's the only surgery that's going to work after you've done all the nasal surgeries of correction of deviated septum, turbinate reduction, tonsils and adenoids, removal of other excess tissue. These are what your ENTs are going to do that are effective, not you triple P. Uh, it also, one of the other problems, again, be aware, if someone is about to have a UPPP, um, which is uvulo, palato, yeah, 
plasty, basically trimming off the um, soft palate and uvula. Not only does it worsen the sleep apnea a year down the road, it makes it almost impossible in some cases to use a CPAP. So try to keep your patients away from u triple ps um, And that may be one of the best things you can do for them. There's a new treatment out, hypoglossal nerve stimulation, where there's a little pack implanted in the chest and the stimulation to the hypoglossal nerve, it has to be timed, the, lead, the chest leads have to be uh, placed correctly so that that uh, stimulator activates on inspiration, so it's timing with the chest muscles. The patient can no longer have MRIs because you've got the battery pack, you've got the wires, you've got the leads implanted. Two-thirds of the patient have 70% improvement we're still seeing what the long-term effects are because it's relatively new. And to titrate it, you have to do what's called a drug-induced sleep endoscopy. Basically, they put someone to sleep, propofol, whatever, see what's happening with the appliance. Also, the final test for sleep appliances, if they're not working, is to do a drug-induced sleep study and record what's happening.